So I wrote this book to share my adventures as one of the early uh, women biologists with Fish and Game. And in this book, I relate my uh, field experiences. And I, I wanted to acquaint people with the animals I worked with and the research methods I used. And to encourage people, especially young ones, uh, young students considering a career in biology, who are encountering difficulties to persevere in attaining their goals. So um, today I'm going to just, I have time just to talk about six of the animals I studied. I'll cover the methods used to count, track, and describe them, and I'll relate some close calls and challenges. I'll tell you what I found and the current status of these populations. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments at the end of the show. So here um, we're gonna get oriented. Uh, of course, here's Alaska. And first I'm going to talk about uh, sockeye salmon in the Copper River. Um, these fish are harvested by the drift gillnet fleet out of Cordova operating in Prince William Sound. And then we're gonna head north and I'll talk about chum salmon studies in the Kotzebue area. And then we'll look at Chinook salmon in the Yukon River. I'll talk about moose research in South Central Alaska. And then we're gonna head back up to the Arctic and I'll talk about some caribou studies. And we'll finally finish up with some uh, red king crab research in Lower Cook Inlet. So here's a map of the Copper River. The Copper River starts at Mount Wrangell and flows 300 miles through the Wrangell St. Elias National Park in the Chugach Mountains to Prince William Sound. And the river has, uh, it's silty because it's glacial, glacial water and it goes down a steep grade at high velocity. There's runs of sockeye salmon and a smaller run of Chinook that support a thriving commercial fishery in Cordova, as well as upriver subsistence and sport fisheries. The area, this is a picture of um, Cordova on a rare sunny day. The area was originally home to the Eak and Chugach native peoples. In 1790, the area was discovered by the Spanish explorer Salvador Fidalgo, who named it Puerto Cordova. And the town itself was born in 1906 when it became a port for a railroad to transport copper ore from the Wrangell Mountains to Cordova. The town sits in a temperate rainforest with heavy rainfall. During my first season there, it rained continuously for 35 days. Now, sockeye salmon shown here are sometimes called red salmon because their spawning colors, their body turns red while the head turns green. The fish go out to sea to feed and mature between ages three and seven and then return to their natal freshwater area to spawn. So my job with the commercial fisheries division was to count the salmon with sonar in the Copper River at a site called Miles Lake, which is just a widening of the river. And we had to use sonar because the fish couldn't be seen in the silty water. Now the Miles Lake camp is 50 miles from Cordova up on the Copper River Highway, which ends at the million dollar bridge shown here because when it was constructed in the early 1900s, it cost about a million dollars to construct. And the highway ends at the bridge because during the 1964 earthquake, you can see over here on the left, a span of the bridge fell into the river. So this is the what it looks like at, in the Copper River at the side of the camp. It's, it's really a stark landscape. So here on the left, we see the south bank of the Copper River with our sonar shed just peeking out of the trees. And it was powered by solar panels. And the shed housed the electronics for the sonar. And down at the bottom of this picture, can you just see a little bit of the water disturbed? Projecting out into the river is a transducer that moves along an underwater rail. 
Now the transducer emits a sonar beam, which is basically sound waves. And the beam returns echoes from fish that are picked up by an electronic counter shown at the bottom there. And the counter automatically prints fish counts on the paper tape. Well, in the early 1980s, we used a single beam sonar that didn't tell us the size or the species of the fish. But today, 40 years later, the Miles Lake Sonar Camp still operating and it uses imaging sonar, like what you'd see in an ultrasound when you go into a doctor's office. And this allows the biologist to tell the size and the species of the fish. Well, what I do, in 1982 is I'd call in the daily counts by ham radio because cell phones I don't think had been invented yet to the fishery manager in Cordova and then he'd decide based on the counts how to regulate the commercial fishery through time area and gear restrictions to achieve an escapement goal which is the number of salmon needed on the spawning grounds to produce enough eggs so that adult returns are sustained year after year. Now the manager had to let enough salmon pass through the commercial fishery so that the escapement goal is met, but also to meet the upriver fisher needs uh, for subsistence and sport fishing. Now, a lot of field research involves problem solving. And the problem with the Miles Lake Camp is that it's located between two big glaciers. Child's Glacier, as you can see here, below the camp. And Child's Glacier was right there. I mean, the river kind of slammed into it, turned the corner and went around, went around the bend. And then upriver, we had Miles Glacier that would send glacier icebergs hurtling downriver, which sometimes collided with the underwater transducer and turning it into crumpled aluminum. Thankfully, we had spare sections. You can see here we're standing on the bank looking dejected because our uh, sonar apparatus had been crumbled by an iceberg. Well, I had a close call on the Copper River. We were building a sonar shed on the north bank, and since the road ended on the south bank, we had to ferry supplies across the river by skiff. One day I loaded up the skiff and was motoring across when suddenly the propeller hit a rock hidden beneath the silty water and sheared off the cotter pin. The cotter pin holds the propeller nut in place and keeps the propeller from falling off the shaft. We lost steering. The fast current took us toward the 300 foot high face of the actively calving Child's Glacier. We had less than a minute before the river carried us into the wall of the glacier. I had a second of panic. I thought I was going to be crushed to death by falling ice, but nope, I threw the anchor out. But the anchor scraped along the bottom and it didn't find purchase until finally it wedged against a rock. Well, I learned to carry spare parts and a toolbox. And because I'd taken a small engine repair class, I knew what to do. I uh, put on a new cotter pin and uh, made sure the propeller was in place and then we sputtered back to the south bank. The point is I was prepared for an emergency um, because I had uh, anticipated trouble and prepared for it. So when you go out in the field, it's a good idea to anticipate trouble and prepare. So in the three years that I was on the Cop River in 1981 to 83, I was fortunate to have seen good salmon runs. And the sockeye salmon runs on the Cop River continue to be um, uh, robust. The recent 10-year commercial harvest averages about 1 million sockeye. And this year, the harvest was 987,000, close to the 10-year average. Well, now I'll take you up north uh, to Kotzebue, where I live for a year and a half. Um, here's a map of Kotzebue. Kotzebue sits at the tip of Baldwin Peninsula, and it's located uh, 33 miles north of the Arctic Circle. It's a Inupiaq village, and the first white man to arrive in Kotzebue was German explorer Otto von Kotzebue, an employee of the Russian government. 
who in 1816 traded tobacco with the locals. And then in the mid-1800s, whaling ships arrived. Well, trade increased and new items brought cultural changes, especially liquor. So in the map of Kotzebue Sound, I want to bring your attention to uh, the Noatak River um, north of Kotzebue and then also Cape Cruisenstern off to the left. We're going to be talking about that. Here's a photo I took of Kotzebue Sound during breakup. And there are chum salmon here. The uh, spawning colors are olive green with purple stripes. Now, chum salmon are also called dog salmon. They spawn in the Noatak River. And the uh, spawn in the fall, the eggs incubate in the gravel in the winter. And then the juveniles emerge in the spring as the ice breaks up and goes down with the river ice to Kotzebue Sound, where they feed for three to four years before returning to spawn. Well, the year I arrived in Kotzebue in 1978, the commercial catch was 142,000. And at 80 cents a pound, the estimated value of the catch was about 990,000, which contributed significantly to the local economy. But the problem with the commercial catch was it fluctuated wildly between years and the buyers couldn't tell whether they were going to get a good year or not, and the fishermen didn't couldn't depend upon the income. So Fishing Game wanted to see if they could stabilize salmon production and give fishermen a more stable income by building a hatchery. However, little was known about the early life history of chum salmon in the Noatak River and Kotzebue Sound, and that's where I came in. I was hired to research the early life history of chum salmon and find a location for a hatchery. So I located chum salmon spawning sites on the Noatak River in the fall, and then I'd flag them. And then I monitored the egg development through the winter. Well, to get to the sites in the winter, I hired a Noatak Inupiaq man named Chester to transport me by snowmobile. So I'd sit in an old wooden sled snow behind, towed behind his snow go, and one day as Chester negotiated ice bridges that were suspended across the open water leads in the river, I shouted, Chester, how do you know the ice bridges will hold? And he turned his head and grinned and said, sometimes I don't. <laughs> well, I discovered that the females buried their eggs in the gravel of warm springs. You can see the steam rising here in the winter from this warm springs. And since water temperature determines the rate of salmon egg development, the higher temperatures created faster development rates. And most eggs in these warm springs hatched in sync with the spring appearance of insects, which were prey for the juveniles to eat. However, this is like a Goldilocks story. Some females selected sites with water temperature too low, so their eggs developed too slow. Others selected sites with temperatures too high, so their eggs developed too fast. I saw in one pool of water juveniles emerging from the gravel in January. And because there was nothing for them to eat, these young salmon died of starvation. Well, I'd uh, follow them in the spring when they emerged down the river. And then I studied their feeding habits and migration routes during the summer. And to capture fish, I used a beach seine shown here either by hand um, on foot or with a boat. And here we are examining the catch. And I took samples back to the lab to uh, do a stomach content analysis to see what the juveniles were eating. So here I am in my little 16 foot skiff sampling the shore waters for juvenile chum. And I went all over Kotzebue Sound in my little skiff, but for trips further along the coast, like the Chukchi Sea, I either used a Boston whaler or teamed up with some biologists that had a 24 foot skiff. And these guys were test fishing for herring. Well, one fateful day, I decided to go with the herring crew to sample the coast of Cape Cruisenstern, shown here. I hadn't sampled that far north yet. 
Now, the closest you'll come to living in prehistoric times is walking the coast of Cape Cruisenstern, a lonely and exposed expanse of sea coast where occasionally woolly mammoth tusks wash onto the ancient beach. Well, we packed the skiff for a four-day trip, and as we entered the Chukchi Sea, the waters quietly rolled with no white caps, and we got to the Cape. We eased the skiff into the mouth of the river and motored upstream to set up camp. Well, you, we used the remaining light to, for beach same sets for my juvenile chum. And the halls were rich in species. We found smelt, cod, flatfish, nine-spine sticklebacks, shrimp, sturgeon poacher, but no juvenile chum salmon. Well, we decided to set the herring nets the following day. And the next morning it was windy, but I didn't see any whitecaps, so we thought that the conditions were okay for setting the nets. And now I'm going to read a little bit from my book. A few minutes later, we were in the swells. It's funny how deceptive the ocean can look from land. The swells were larger than we had expected, maybe eight feet high and close together. Trying to set nets off the bow would be difficult, so Joe quickly changed his mind and made a terrible mistake. He turned the skiff 90 degrees to return to the beach. Broadside to the swells, the skiff was instantly swamped and flipped upside down. It was that fast in a fraction of a second, and I was underwater with the skiff on top of me, frantically kicking away from the gillnets as they swirled around my legs. The underwater froth churned nets and gear violently around me and clouded my vision. The searing cold water choked the breath out of me and its weight pulled me down. Two imperatives drove my terrified struggles, to get away from the skiff and head to shore. Thankfully, we'd not motored out far, so the beach was close. As my feet stumbled against the ocean floor, I half swam and half dragged myself out from the breakers. Joe arrived on shore a few moments later, and then the skiff washed up. We grabbed the bow line and tried to hold the skiff as the waves crashed down on us, but the sand gave way underneath, and it was as if a giant force, an undertow, pulled the skiff out to sea. Well, we had washed ashore on the other side of the river. So we had to walk upstream to where the river narrowed enough to swim across. Well, I kicked my boots off and carried them in one hand and plunged in. And I was soaking wet anyway and swam across and got to the other side. The river was slow moving and it wasn't difficult to get across. Well, on the other shore, I, I pulled myself up and I looked across and Joe was still standing there. And I said, Joe, swim across. And it's then when he said, I can't swim. So his anxiety increased while we both slipped further into hypothermia. And I knew I had to go get him. So I swam back across the river and I put him into a life-saving hold that I'd learned while taking a class at UC Riverside. And for a third time, I swam across that river, which by this time was getting pretty difficult. So I, I made it somehow to the tent and got out of my wet clothes and got into my sleeping bag. And then I went into violent shivering thermogenesis for about 20 minutes. But shivering helps the body stay warm. And it's when you can't shiver that you are dangerously hypothermic. Well, two days later, a search plane came looking for us because they'd found the skiff washed ashore. And we were survivors. <laughs> We've survived this adventure. Well, from my research in uh, Kotzebue, I found no shortage of food for the juveniles. In fact, the suitable warm springs area for spawning appeared to be the factor limiting chum salmon production in Kotzebue Sound. And I did find a site for hatchery it was located at a warm springs up the Noatak River. And here's a, a picture of the first canyon. You can get an idea of what the river looks like in the country up there. It was just upriver from this area. And the river, the locals called it Sikasuliak, which is roughly translated place that does not freeze in winter. 
And this, uh, the state of Alaska operated the fishery, um, the hatchery for 15 years. And it had a peak return of 90,000 adult chum salmon. But then the hatchery was shuttered when the state of Alaska decided to get out of the commercial fish production business. And they turned all the hatcheries over to private nonprofits, except for research, research hatcheries and those hatcheries connected to production of fish for sport fishing. So the last salmon project I'll talk about is on the Yukon River. I worked uh, on a Chinook salmon project on the Yukon River in the mid 80s. Now the Yukon River is 1,980 miles long. It's actually the third largest in America besides the um, Missouri and Mississippi. It originates in Canada and flows west through Alaska to the Bering Sea. The Yukon has one of the longest salmon migrations in the world. If you can see on the map here, the village of Amonic sits at the river's mouth. And I spent about a month at the river of uh, uh, and the village of Amonic sampling fish and then traveled all up uh, along the river to its headwaters sampling fish. Now here's a Chinook salmon in spawning colors. They have black speckles on the back with a, a little bit of pink along the sides. And the Chinook in the Yukon typically get up to around 30 pounds, I would say was a, a good size Chinook for the Yukon. Now commercial fishing here is one of the few sources of income for Yukon residents who also rely on subsistence fishing as food for humans and sled dogs. Native peoples of the river say to us, salmon is life. So in 1986 and 87, when I was on the Yukon, the Chinook fishery here was one of the largest in Alaska with an average ex vessel value of $4 million. So for management purposes, the Yukon is divided into six regulatory districts. And on this map, you can see little numbers. There's one two marshals and two, three is between Marshall and Holy Cross. Four is a really big uh, district and then five and six, the Tanana River. So most of the harvest occurs from early June to mid July in districts one and two where fish are taken in set and drift gill nets. Well, conflicts arose when the Alaskans took too many fish leaving few for Canadians. A treaty was needed between the United States and Canada to reduce Alaskan interception of Canadian origin fish. So in March of 1985, the US and Canada ratified the Pacific Salmon Treaty, which was an agreement to cooperate in the management and research and enhancement of salmon stocks of mutual and concern. The Yukon River Salmon Agreement is specified in Chapter 8 of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Under the Yukon River Salmon Agreement, Alaskan fishery managers are obligated to allow a target range of Chinook to pass unscathed through Alaska to reach Canada. The tricky part for us biologists in 1986 was trying to figure out what portion of the fish swimming in the redder river at any given moment were Canadian fish in order to limit their interception. At the same time, fishery managers wanted Alaskans to harvest salmon for their economic and cultural benefit. So my job was to estimate the interception of Canadian origin fish by fishermen in Alaska. The information was needed to judge compliance of the United States with the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. And we had um, the Department of the State looking over our shoulders. So what I did was I sampled um, the river's headwaters up to the, the, so I sampled fish along the entire river starting at the mouth. As you can see the top picture here, this is in the village of Amonic, which sits on the Yukon River Delta. You can see how flat the marshland is. And the Delta, which at 50,000 square miles in size, is one of the largest river deltas on Earth. 
Imanic is home to the Yupik people who live a subsistence lifestyle. And I sampled all the way up to the headwaters here, lower, the lower photo is up in the Yukon territory, the little salmon river. And we partnered with the Canadians who were great fun and they gave us t-shirts that they designed out of an American bald eagle in a tug of war with the Canadian beaver over a salmon, giving a light tone to an otherwise serious situation. So I sampled fish by taking their scales, which are aged by counting the bands of ridges laid down during a fish's growth. Like you can age a tree ring, uh, a tree by counting its rings, but we would count the bands of ridges that were close together. So the bands of ridges that are the darker bands, those represent slow winter growth. And those further apart, are summer growth when there's more food to eat and the water temperature is warmer and the fish are growing faster. And to tell the age, you count the band. So I'll, I'll show you how to count how old this fish scale is. You start at the middle called the focus and you see one dark band and a second dark band that represents two winters spent in fresh water. And then you see a, a big, uh, wide area of ridges before we get to another dark band. That's the fish's first summer in the ocean. You can see what tremendous growth they're putting on by feeding in the ocean. So this spent, uh, this fish spent four winters in the ocean, one, two, three, four. So the total age of this fish was six years old. So we discovered that the ridges not only tell us how old the fish is, but they have a pattern, like your like your fingers uh, have a, a, a fingerprint pattern. And we could tell by their pattern, their growth history, which was reflected from different parts of the river drainage. So we could tell whether fish came from the lower, middle, or upper river drainage, which was mostly Canada, um, by the pattern laid down on their scales. And this technique was called scale pattern analysis. So by looking at the scale pattern, I could tell Canadian fish from Alaskan fish because the Canadian fish had a different growth history or pattern laid down on their scales. So I measured the patterns in thousands of scale samples from salmon that had spawned in the lower, middle, and upper streams. And then using a computer program, I compared those patterns to thousands of scale samples from the commercial fishery. In this, in this manner, we could follow post-season the mean interception rates of Canadian origin fish. And if the Alaskans caught too many, then next year, the managers would adjust the fishing periods to allow more Canadian fish to pass. Usually, this is this is a, a principle, fish that have the farthest to go are the earliest to arrive in the river. So by closing more fishing periods early in the season, this would allow more Canadian fish to pass through Alaska and get to Canada. So another idea that was emerging at this time was DNA analysis. So we not only had to take scale samples, but we had to sample the carcasses of fish by taking oh, heart tissue and liver tissue and muscle tissue. And we had to suck out the eyeball fluid from scales uh, from the fish using a pipette, which was a, a smelly gooey job. But at that time, the geneticists didn't know which tissues would give the best DNA um, sample. So today, scale pattern is no longer used. It's been replaced by um, DNA called genetic stock identification. Well, I was fortunate to have worked on the Yukon River when Chinook were abundant. In 1987, when I was there, the commercial harvest was 200,000 Chinook salmon. But since about the year 2000, Chinook and the Yukon have declined precipitously. 
The declining stocks are likely victims of an interplay of a warming climate, interception on the high seas, bycatch, and overfishing. Last year, the total Chinook run um, was about 45,000 fish, and that didn't come close to meeting the escapement goal. For example, the Canadian escapement goal is about 50,000 fish, but last year the Canadians only counted 12,000 on their spawning grounds. This crisis has elevated emotions about who has the right to a now scarce resource in the Yukon River. It's been a really big problem and uh, economic and a food um, shortfall for the Yukon River residents. Now we'll go on to moose studies. So I worked in the town of Palmer in the um, oh, late 70s in South Central Alaska. And uh, many of you know that Palmer uh, was created during the Great Depression when the federal government resettled over 200 farming families from the hard hit Midwest to the Matanuska Susitna Valley. And the game biologist here manages game populations, primarily moose, and game management units 14, as well as a cross cook inlet in 16. So in this area, there's two major roads and the railroad goes uh, from Talkeetna to Willow down to Anchorage. And most of the area is sparsely populated boreal forest surrounded by mountain ranges. So as the assistant game biologist in Palmer, my primary duties were to conduct aerial moose surveys and to deal with calls concerning human moose interactions. Now, this is a photo that I took from an airplane of Mount Susitna Beluga. It was part of my uh, count area for moose. And moose are big. Uh, they can weigh up to 1,600 pounds, standing seven feet tall at the shoulder. This is a young bull moose I took uh, in grazing in my backyard. Although solitary by nature, groups of moose will move between calving grounds in the spring and feeding areas in the summer, rutting areas in the fall, and overwintering range. So I conducted aerial surveys of moose on their winter range when their moose are easy to see against the white snow, but before most bulls have shed their antlers. And here are some of my count areas. Here's a Sunflower Basin and Cahiltna Glacier, which sits right below uh, Denali National Park. And we flew count areas in the same manner every year to generate population trends over time. As we approached a count area, we looked for little brown moose shapes. Can you see the six little brown moose in this uh, aerial photo? So survey conditions had to be just right to have a good moose count. Ideal conditions are enough snow on the ground, the temperature 30 below or above, the wind not more than 30 miles an hour and enough light to see by. So bad weather can delay or cancel surveys leading to incomplete information for managers. So what I do is I drive at the small airport early because we didn't want to waste the short supply of winter daylight. And I dressed warmly because the inside of the survey plane was not much warmer than the outside air. And the pilot would be already there fueling the plane. And now I'm going to read to you a little bit from the book. So one of the best planes for aerial surveys is the PA. 18, a fixed wing two seat super cub equipped with long range fuel tanks. It has a slow speed of travel about 90 miles an hour, which allows enough time to get a good look at the animals, yet the plane has great maneuverability needed for steep turns at low airspeed. I knew that low altitude aerial surveys were dangerous, but I was excited about the adventure and the chance to do a job only a handful of chosen people could do. The weather could change fast and be different between valleys. There were times when snow tumbled suddenly from low clouds obscuring the wingtips, much less the terrain. Then we flew blind, 
and I trusted the pilot to know our exact position in relation to the surrounding hills as he searched for a visible landmark. So um, I counted in Sunflower Basin 603 moose, and the bull to cow ratio was 44 bulls per 100 cows, but the calf to cow ratio was only 19 calves per 100 cows. And uh, I was worried about that. That was a low number of calves. Moose numbers are affected by the severity of the winter, by predators, and of course, by hunting. So moose don't like to stand in deep snow because it leaves them vulnerable to wolf attacks and foods harder to find. So they seek areas that have been cleared of snow like railroad tracks. So moose uh, near a human population leads to interactions with sometimes catastrophic results. So uh, engineers with the Alaska Railroad try to avoid hitting moose by running pilot cars ahead of the trains or by sounding the whistle to scare them off the tracks. But despite these efforts, moose deaths from train hits are high. In 1978, 171 moose were killed by trains just in the section from Talkeetna to Willow. And when possible, moose, um, moose meat is killed by cars or trains is salvaged and donated to charity. Well, I answered calls that came in about struck moose. The troopers would call the Palmer office and I'd drive to the scene. And if people were injured, the troopers would have sent them off in an ambulance and dispatched mortally wounded moose with a shot to the head. But I helped the troop remove the carcass to the side of the road and then I, I sampled the moose. I took down its um, condition and its, its sex. And I also collected the lower jaw bone and we would age the teeth just like a tree by counting the rings laid down on the, on the tooth of the moose. So as a warming climate creates milder winters, overwinter survival of moose can increase. And while an abundance of moose is good news, more moose roaming the streets where humans inhabit corresponds to more collisions. Now, biolo biologists can attempt to reduce moose vehicle collisions with targeted hunts in high traffic areas or constructing a moose uh, fence, as you see here in this photo on the left. But it doesn't seem to have affected this moose um, because he's crossing the road. So I don't know what the fence was doing, but it wasn't keeping the moose off of the highway. So those are some challenges for the moose managers. So um, my field work on the Western Arctic caribou occurred primarily in the Kobuk River Valley, which is now a national park. And uh, the drainage includes the Kobuk sand dunes, soon seen here, which is a surprising 25 square mile desert of shifting sands in the Arctic. There are 32 herds of caribou in Alaska distinguished by their calving grounds. This is a map of the Western Arctic herd. The calving grounds are in yellow. The uh, summer feeding in green. And then the migration corridor is in pink. And the, the kind of uh, gray area is their overwintering range. So bull uh, caribou shown here can get up to about 400 pounds. So to monitor movements and the life history of caribou, biologists can use radio telemetry, where they attach radio collars around their necks and listen for radio signals from an airplane. Well, I helped to capture and radio collar caribou at Onion Portage, which is on the Kobuk River. Now, the Onion Portage is a renowned archaeological site with human occupation dating back 12,500 years, shown here and left. It's a, also the traditional site where caribou choose to cross the Kobuk River as they migrate from summer grounds north of the Baird Mountains to winter grounds south of the Waring Mountains. Well, one of the guys had a great idea. He said, 
Well, let's um, lasso the river, the caribou from boats as they swim across the river. So um, I don't think that he was trying to be a cowboy. The, the problem with um, darting um, caribou with immobilizing drugs from a helicopter is that during the fall, the male caribou don't process the immobilizing drug very well, um, which can lead to fatality. So biologists always try to find a capture method to sample the animals that is the least harmful. So here's a picture of us in the boat, and that's me in the middle with the hat with my, <laughs> with my lariat, and I'm trying to uh, lasso the caribou horns and we'd pull the bull up to the side of the boat and then somebody would dangle over the edge and um, with the tiniest little screws you ever saw in your life uh, try to attach the radio collar around the caribou. So um, monitoring the caribou herd during the winter is important because snow conditions affect their ability to reach the grasses and the lichens they need. If they can't get to food, some will starve and the herd will decline. So in April of 1980, I put on warm winter clothes and along with a fellow biologist got into a Cessna 185 on skis bound for the Caribou Winter Range. My job was to record the number of calves and cows to estimate the calf to cow ratio in spring. When compared to last July's ratio, you know, when they were calved, we would get an estimate of the overwinter calf survival, a significant herd limiting factor. So um, what we would do is we'd uh, sit out on the, the snow. You can see my fellow biologist here is with a spotter scope and um, we just sit there and watch the caribou. I took a picture of them uh, go across the horizon and um, jot down in our notebooks the composition. We could tell the animals by their um, size and um, tell which ones are cows and which ones were the calves and which ones were the bulls. Now, currently, the Western Arctic herd population is in a slow decline. That's about 164,000 animals, which is about a third of its peak 20 years ago. And because of climate change, um, the tundra lichen and the mosses that the caribou eat are being replaced by woody shrubs, which is not ideal caribou food. Now, the last uh, project I'm going to talk about is uh, the Red King crab research. I was the lower cook inlet shellfish research biologist, and my job was to assess shellfish and the commercial fisheries impacts on these resources. And to do this, a quarter of my time was spent on the water, surveying, sampling crab and shrimp. My research area was Cape Fairfield over to Cape Douglas, and most of my time was spent in the Southern and Kamishak districts, but we also paid attention to the barren outer and Eastern districts. Now, Lower Cook Inlet includes Kachemak Bay, which is where Homer, the, the beautiful town of Homer sits. As you can see here, um, this is a photo I took of Kachemak Bay. And here's a, a red king crab. Now, red king crab can live to 20 to 30 years with males weighing up to 20 pounds with a five foot leg span. This is obvious as a small one in the photo. The females brew brood eggs in a flap on their belly for 11 months, releasing larvae into the ocean that settle on the bottom and grow a calcium exoskeleton. So here I am measuring the size of the carapace, which is the, the outer shell. And it tells me how old the crab is because as the crabs age, they shed their old shell and grow a new one. And the new one is a larger size. So I can tell how many years old this crab is by measuring the size of the carapace. Well, harvest of red king crab here in Lower Cook Inlet in the 1940s 
was low, but by the 1960s, fishing for king crab expanded and it, boats harvested up to 8 million pounds a year. Then the harvest of king crab fell dramatically. The Southern District Fishery was closed in 1982 and the Kamishak Fishery was closed in 1983. The local fleet switched to other crab like Tanner Crab and Dungeness as a source of income while they waited in vain for the king crab stocks to recover. This is the research vessel I, I operated out of. It was 67 feet long and equipped with various fishing gear. And in the background is Augustine Island. It's an active volcano. So to survey king crab, we used commercial fishing pots that were seven by seven feet in size. And the pots weighed 700 pounds each. So here's a pot sitting on what's called a pot launcher on the side. So um, as we approached the a station, the pot would be plucked from a stack on the stern and um, maneuvered with a hydraulic winch to sit on the pot launcher. And then we would um, put bait jars in with chopped frozen herring. You can see the little bait jars hanging there to entice the crab to come into the pot. And then um, once the skipper told us we were at a station, we would tip the pot into the ocean and throw the line and the buoy afterwards. Now we had to measure the line to not only the ocean depth, but also tidal action because if the buoy fell beneath the surface, then we wouldn't be able to retrieve the pot after 24 hours, which was the standard soak time. So we dump about um, 40 pots in stations in a line, and then we'd anchor and wait 24 hours, and then we'd start pulling the pots. And then the lower on the right, uh, we'd pull the pot, and we'd dump the contents into a tote. And here you can see me in the orange coat uh, picking up a tanner crab. The pots would catch both the king and the tanner crab because the species overlapped in habitat. And on my surveys, I found record low numbers uh, of crab and the juveniles were the lowest we'd seen on record. So these fisheries remained closed and have never reopened. Well, we thought that diminishing crab populations were likely due to changing ocean conditions and overfishing for sure. Um, the fishing manager had no business allowing boats to harvest, in my opinion, 8 million pounds. And there was also increasing predator fish moving in. And I could see the uh, Pacific gray cod moving into Kachemak Bay, and we'd catch them sometimes in the pot. And when we opened up the stomach, there'd be 25 baby tanner crabs in their stomach. So these bottom fish are voracious predators of the crab. But then another theory emerged, and it was reduced number of eggs. So here I am over on the left examining a clutch of eggs in a female king crab. And I sometimes would find eggs that look gray and gooey, like they were diseased or dead. And this raised suspicion of a parasite that could be causing egg mortality. So I started sampling eggs and I sent them to specialists to analyze. And they discovered a new species of Nemertian worm predator shown here on the right. It's only one millimeter in length, that tiny but it was discovered in the egg samples. Now, worm larvae float in the ocean and all the time, and they find crabs to settle on, and then they migrate to the eggs, and they, they eat the eggs and destroy them. But uh, in Kachemak Bay, the egg loss was virtually total in the 83-84 brood season. So the cause of the sudden appearance of the parasitic worm infestation was unknown. I mean, the worms have always been in the ocean, 
but why they exploded into an epidemic in certain crab populations across Alaska remains a mystery. Although I do know that when populations are stressed, like during times of low abundance, they can become increasingly vulnerable to disease and parasites. Well, perhaps the parasitic outbreaks have occurred historically in the past, but they just went unnoticed by humans. Well, the brood failures from near total egg mortality obviously prolong the recovery of the crab populations. So I wanted to briefly mention a few challenges I faced in the years as a field biologist that for me fall into three categories. The first set of challenges were related to the weather or the gear or unexpected situations. And again, my best advice here is to be prepared like when I capsized off the coast of Cape Cruisenstern, I had on a float coat, I knew how to swim, and I could rescue my colleague because I'd taken a, a, a life-saving class. Now, the second challenge what I faced um, was because I was the first woman to undertake many jobs. My strength and ability were questioned, and this is not unreasonable. I had to prove I could do the job. Supervisors questioned whether the stakeholders would accept me, the hunters, the fishers, the trappers, and all I could do was do my best and wait for their opinions to change. At one job in particular, men resisted change to what they thought was a stable workplace and what it should look like. So resistance to change continues today in many parts of society, but I think that fishing game in Alaska has changed for the better because today there are many more women biologists. And most of the time I was given great opportunities. It was up to me to prove my worth. And in the book, I talk about integrating motherhood with my career. I would just say it was possible to do that because I arranged for triple backup childcare I had supervisors who were somewhat flexible and a husband who was somewhat helpful. <laughs> so that's the end of my talk. And you can read more about um, animals and adventures I had with them in my book. Do you have any comments or questions? Anybody? Yeah, I, yes, um, I had a. Go ahead, Ron. No, go ahead, Mary. Well, I'm um, th that last those last topics you um, touched on, which is women in science and how what it was like for women when uh, in a male oriented field. I was just wondering um, who some of your early role models were. I know there were scientists at the university and Judy. Triple Horn can really speak to this, but uh, Vera Alexander and the, the bird biologist, I can't bring up her name right now, but there were quite a few and they were pioneers. And um, did they influence you or what, what, what got you going? Well, when I first came to Alaska, I didn't know anybody. I did come to meet Vera. In fact, she hired me. I was a professor with the School of Fishery and Ocean Sciences for 10 years. So I got to know Vera quite well. But in my early years, I would say my role models were Margaret Mead and Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of fishing game, there was one woman, Kathy Frost, she was a marine mammal biologist, but I didn't really work with her or know her well. I didn't have any, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just pioneers, right? I mean, I wasn't the only woman. There were a few scattered around the state, but we were all just kind of trying to get through the day, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody else? Yeah, about the caribou and the Western Arctic caribou herd. Uh, I understand that uh, very few of the caribou are even crossing the Kobuk anymore and or at Onion Portage. And they're, the last number of years, they haven't extended their winter range um, south of the Kobuk, and that there are more, m many more caribou uh, staying north in the Brooks Range now. Right, Earth. yeah, there's, their range contracts and changes when there's less of them. 
And I did want to mention the climate change. It, it could be that they are uh, staying further north. Um, as you know, uh, well, you likely know the warble flies uh, are just terrible and, and pester them. And perhaps they want to stay further north to get away from the the biting flies. But um, further north too means that their lichens and mosses likely haven't been um, the creeping of vegetation change hasn't gotten that far north yet. So their preferred foods are maybe further north. Anybody else? Well, I worked all I, over the I, state and it was a it's a wonderful way to see Alaska to be transferred to different areas. I'm I'm sure many of you have lived in Cordova or Homer or Kotzebue or wherever. Peggy, what, what's your current project, Peggy? What are you working on today? Oh, um, well, I have been um, giving a version of this talk to um, students and it's been lots of fun. I've, uh, I've talked to um, the University of Montana fish and wildlife students and then uh, recently students um, at uh, UC Riverside and uh, UC Davis fish and wildlife students um, trying to um, prepare them for field work and inspire them for field work and get them acquainted with um, some of their career options once they graduate from college. I'm scheduled to talk when I come back to uh, San Diego in May at um, UC San Diego. So one of my projects is uh, going around to the different colleges that have fish and wildlife programs and um, just talking to them as an experienced field biologist saying, hey, this is what it can be like for you. Um, this is what you need to prepare for. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. I just love working with the students. And I started another book, actually. So when I get it done, <laughs> maybe I'll be able to uh, give you another talk on it. Right. And what is the other book about, Peggy? Well, this is going to be um, post-World uh, War II and the American occupation in Germany. And what I do is I get a trove of historical documents, photos, um, uh, oral histories um, that nobody else has seen. Uh, for example, that happened with the Rocher Creasy story. And so I do research to flesh it out and then I um, bring it to light, the history that's never been heard before. And so I am in possession of some um, uh, material uh, about what it was like at the end of World War II and the Americans coming in with a challenging occupation and with the Cold War starting surveillance and monitoring of the Soviets in the East. Um, it was just a really challenging time and including the Berlin airlift. Uh, after the war, there was such a food shortage and the people suffered greatly. Um, but I just feel compelled to bring a woman's, it's a woman's story um, forward. Um, and a lot of uh, oral history now we're losing from that generation that is passing away. So I want to preserve it. it. Sounds good. You know, I don't know if you considered bringing this program or something similar to it into high schools. I could see this fitting certain curriculum. And um, I don't know if you've looked into that for Alaska or not. Well, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, when I gave a talk to the Retired Teachers Association, there was one teacher that was not retired. And she asked me to give a Zoom talk on the Rocher Creasy book um, to her high school class at West Valley. So that's um, that's the only high school talk I've given 
you know, I've been contacting the colleges. I did talk also at a graduate class at um, UAF. By the way, I didn't forget about UAF, but I just have to hook up with teachers who are interested in um, what I have to say. Yeah, and I don't know any current teachers, and I don't know if we have marine biology classes here or not. So, because some of the the things that you were giving about the fish and that would be fascinating for a marine biology class in the high school level. So, mm -hmm. well, I think we're past five o'clock, and I just want to thank you. Your talks are so interesting, and they're so well prepared. I'm just fascinated by the things I learned so much, and. Thank you so much for coming again. I really oh, appreciate it. Oh, you're very it. welcome. I, I enjoy um, sharing my hard work um, with people who appreciate it.